Uh, good evening, and welcome to the first uh, dual duet uh, lecture of, of this academic year, something invented by Hernan, um, uh, where academics and practitioners come to the table, give a short lecture, and then, and then um, engage each other directly in, uh, uh, as a conversation or otherwise as um, jujitsu. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see how it goes down. Um, so, uh, tonight we have Brett Steele, Director of the Architectural Association in London, and Hernan Diaz Alonso, Director of SciArc, Facing Off. They'll be speaking about genealogies and precedents. Since I think all of you know who these two guys are, I thought I'd say a few words about um, the significance of the directors of SciArc and AA coming together in this way. Um, for one thing, it's an opportunity to consider the parallel and, I, uh, but I would argue, rarely connected intellectual genealogies of the two schools. Um, both SciArc and the AA are independent schools of architecture, which makes them similar in structural ways, ways that make them both intense and fragile. Both schools are the result of a dissatisfaction had by a group of architects and students at a transformative time in history. So they no doubt share an ethos, but as much as they share an ethos, they have a different pathos and defend a different set of positions. I might describe the relation between our schools as one of love tempered with slight suspicion. Uh, right now, this is obviously a total generalization, but right now, SciArc um, as an entity is strongly vested in the arts and humanities in terms of form, abstraction, legibility, and medium specificity toward the production of specific cases of architecture, while the AA, arguably, uh, tends to align itself with research and the sciences in, the, in terms of material behavior, networks, and processes in the production of architectural and aesthetic systems. Of course, even as I say this, these tendencies are beginning to shift, but not towards a merging of the two lineages, rather towards mutation and further distinction. So even though we may share, even though we may share little in terms of direct intellectual lineage, I'm intrigued that our schools have a strangely familiar set of milestones in their development, shown here. Um, for instance, directly following the events of May 68 in Paris, both schools were either born or reborn. Um, in 1972, SciArc was founded uh, uh, by Ray Cappy, Tom Main, and others who wanted to leave the state institutional system in search of new models of architectural education and counterculture. At the same time, actually one year earlier, the AA was fighting becoming a state-controlled entity, um, and it was on the verge of dissolving altogether. Instead, faculty and students fought back, and ultimately Alvin Boyarsky was chosen as director. It was a crucial move. Um, uh, so both SciArc and the AA cast aside institutional and government support and became free market, both in the financial and cultural sense. In the 70s and 80s, both schools engaged the idea that a curriculum should come bottom up and that studio lotteries, option studios or unit studios, um, and international juries were the best way to ensure relevancy of ideas and keep faculty on their toes. In some ways, Moss's 13-year tenure here as director has threads leading all the way back to Boyarsky in terms of how he dealt with faculty and curriculum and how he brought the school to, into its mature form. Brett's 11-year tenure also resonates in that way, especially in terms of the sheer amount of publications, international programs, and brands like the DRL that he's created. Also, like Denari and Moss, Brett has fought for the long-term stabilization of his school with real estate ventures that probably would have been politically untenable back in the 1970s, even if they had had the money. So anyway, I was looking at Brett's, and I would love to go through this, but I don't want to go on too long. Um, so anyway, I was looking at Brett's website, and I found this great uh, lecture title, What If a School Were a Planet? And I, I like that very much. And I thought, um, I thought I could build on that and say, what if SciArc and the AA were a binary star? Uh, I like that because it allows us to be distinct entities and to signal to each other and even feed off of one another, but ultimately retain our edges. So I'd like to... Um, Most very hot and bright stars are found in close... Whoa! Hold on. I'd like to share with you this very accurate and scientific analysis 
of the relationship between CIRC and the Architectural Association. Uh, Errors. True. These high mass stars have short lives and evolve rapidly. That's right. This artist's impression shows the typical life of such a brilliant pair. One star starts to suck material from the other. Sometimes. The vampire star rotates faster and becomes no, flatter. No, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so that's it. So anyway, there is, there, is no, there is no vampire star, and I'd like to welcome Hernan and Brett to the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, as Tom was saying, this is, the, 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 this is the last talk of the semester, and it, it works as a bridge towards the spring, which we're going to have more of these duels and duets. Uh, it's not that they are duels and duets. It's at the end of the day, we'll figure it out if it was a duel or it was a duet. So that is to be seen. Um, there was no question in my mind what the, what the student um, wanted to invite Brett to do the last lecture, that it was a great idea. Um, <coughs> it's always a pleasure to share any conversation with Brett. Um, in my mind, he's one of the best deans, directors, however, however each institution called us. Uh, that is out there um, for many reasons, not only what he does in the school, but also with his generosity and is always willing to expand what the school is and what an idea of architecture is. So um, I want to thank Brett once again to be here. He comes very often to SIAR, the same way I go very often to the AA, and I cannot think of any other school to be associated with in the, in the long run. And for a long time, we were always talking about Lola, London, LA. Um, so. I'm going to try to be a proper host. Uh, my mom told me when you invite somebody to your house or your home, you let them speak. So unlike in many other situations, I'm not going to try to over speak over you. I'm going to let you speak more because people listen to me here fairly often. So I'd much rather that they listen to you. But I want to do like a, a brief uh, intro of the angle. Uh, I, I have a sense what you're going to talk about, duels and duets and the subject of it, and, and I propose to Brett that eventually we'll, we will blend into a conversation that we start to shape uh, a month ago in Syracuse about precedence uh, or genealogy as different ways to construct knowledge in architecture, which I will argue is also a duel, a duel or a duet by himself. Um, but what I, what I want to frame is uh, a different context in terms of the conversations that sometimes happens in these duels and duets inside the academic environment. And I want to advocate or put on the table uh, something else that I think is floating around and I think is taking shape more and more. And I'm going to use a couple of examples to build that very small argument. Um, OK, never mind. We'll do it manually. So the architect, and what is an architect is a, is a long, long debate, and we'll do it every day in our schools. And I want to start with this clip, which I think it represents the notion of what I will call the Anglo-Saxon architect academic model. Hello. I've been waiting for you three. Who are you? Yeah, who are you? I am the architect. But please, call me Larry. Hey, Larry. <laughs> Larry. <laughs> I created The Matrix and several popular video games, including Cubert and Dig Dug. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. I didn't create Frogger, but I came up with the name for it. Can you believe they wanted to call it Highway Crossing Frog? <laughs> that is so lame. I know. It's the lamest thing I've ever heard of. Highway crossing frog. Why am I here? Yeah, why are we here? Is there an echo in here? Is, Is there, there an, an echo, echo in here? The MTB Movie Awards are a systemic anomaly inherent to the programming of the Matrix. Although the transport process has altered your consciousness, you irrevocably remain human. Ergo, concordantly, vis-a-vis. -vis. You know what? I have no idea what the hell I'm saying. I just thought it would make me sound cool. You haven't answered my question. 
I'm feeling a little vulnerable right now, so you just need to chill out. Hmm? So, um, you, you, can, you can picture yourself, yourself the rest of it, but is we talk about it, we invent words, we make it complicated, we sound, we become vulnerable, it's insensible, and so on. Um, but also, I would argue that in current times, to me, one of the most interesting contributions in terms of how we think about architecture, it has to do with a much more a rebirth of what I would call the brutal approach of the making. So in a way, the production of things is becoming, in a way, the theoretical frame, and I would argue that Many of the things that we're doing here in the school have to do with that. And I think this, this picture probably exemplifies um, a little bit that attitude. But this, as we know, is not really that new. It has been in our discipline for a long time. Um, so how that operates, and I think it's an interesting problem with this notion, as I said, that was present in some genealogy. And I think in many, many ways, I think right now, um, interesting schools like the SIAC, like the AA, are debating into this. What are the models? What are the contexts? How we frame the disciplinary knowledge? Is there is such thing as a disciplinary knowledge? Where are the limits and so on? So I want to use two examples of different kind of uh, animals of architecture, but both of them related to the problem of formalism. So somebody like Enric Mirages, it will totally fall in this category of the present architect. Believe it or not, everything that Enric produced can be traced to Le Corbusier work, each, each of his projects. So these are architects, architects. They are incredibly disciplinary, even though the work that he produced, it may seem at that time exotic or outside the norm. It was deeply rooted in the discipline. And it was not deeply rooted in, this, in the discipline by a grammar or a formal language, but it was rooted in discipline by the construction of drawings but the notion of assembly, but the notion of to understand everything as a piece of tectonic. Like every drawing was done with the desire to be built. There was, not, there was no fascination, there was no fetishization of anything else, but the geometry as a vehicle for the production of architecture. So in a way, somebody like, somebody like Enrique actually is very rooted in what I would call the moral code of modernism, and still in many, many ways is the main rule on how we understand architecture. Now, as I said, I promise to be brief, so I'll, I'll, I'll let Brett to expand. Um, the other example, which already was giving you the finger, is Frank. Frank Gehry, this is Frank Gehry, circa 78, uh, showing the cardboard desk and he was doing. But if you go to the, the show that is right now in LAGMA, this is a different kind of animal, because nobody can argue that everything that Frank does is not an eminent piece of architecture. But it's very, very difficult to understand what kind of presence are in play. So I would call this is much more in the genealogy. You can see that it belongs to the disciplinary discourse, but it doesn't belong to a particular clear heritage. It's much more contaminated by art and many other fields and disciplines. But also, at the same time, there is zero fetishization about many things that, let's say, academic architects like drawings or renders of this and so on, everything that is produced is to the service to be built. So even the models are like mini buildings. So there is almost not everything that is done is done with it. So in a way, one could argue that there's nobody who's more architects, more, more an architect than Frank, but at the same time, when you try to trace or try to pin him up in somewhere else, is impossible to read, and it, 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 most of his work is rooted in kind of a much more artistic expression, but somehow it evolved to produce a better architectural effect. The reason I choose these two examples, because in a way, they are the duet and the duel that always operated in my own head. So in a way, I always going back between presence and genealogy in my own head, and these two guys, which I would call the ultimate, most sophisticated formalists of the last 50 years, both of them will rely in the specificity of what they were doing, and the theoretical, the discourse, will emanate by the production of it, and it will not emanate by the predetermination of any kind of uh, manifesto or some kind of theoretical language. It's all in the making. And I think in the latent, I would say, evolution of the current technology that we are, I think we are going into a phase similar to that in relation to the production. In any case, it's not exactly uh, a response. It's just to introduce some of the issues and. Now I'll pass the microphone and the keyboard to Brett. Cool, thanks. This is yours, right? 
Uh, it, that's not working. So let me let me see. Tell you, let's try with yours because this one is not working. I've got one. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it's over there. I'll bring it to you. Thanks. Right on. Thank you for that. Thanks for the setup and uh, and an opening that I think will make make for a good conversation in a minute. Um, Tom, thank you. Where did Tom go? Thank you for for an intro. I think an intro with a diagram is a fantastic thing. Always try and live up to the diagram, but it's going to be hard. Um, and yes, I was. We we were chatting a month or so ago uh, uh, about this uh, fantastic new series, which I'm a huge fan of as a as an idea and. Um, I thought it would be an opportunity to, to rehearse some of the lessons we've, we've gone through um, trying to do something very similar back in London and in various other settings in, in recent years. Um, f first point, maybe, would be to just look at the two terms themselves and the, the kind of frame that's setting this series up. And I'm trying to figure out who I'll be talking to this evening, and I haven't reached a conclusion yet, although I think... I'm trying to make a presentation to those people who are going to find themselves sitting between the two people in these chairs in the coming weeks and months and probably years if the series goes forward in the way that I think it will, which are those people that are at times moderators, at other times referees, um, and often sheer fabricators of things that try and make sense out of an evening that, um, that hopefully won't be as scripted as many forms of presentations these days. So just very briefly, to start with the two terms, what I find interesting in duels and duets is, of course, they are both art forms that are distinctly Anglo-American in their formation. They are largely modern. The idea of a duel as we know it uh, appears in about the 18th to early 19th century in Europe in a very strictly defined form of combat, originally started with, for the most part, senior military officers aiming pistols at one another, but very quickly evolved into a form in which anyone in the upper classes and nobility in countries like Europe and France um, uh, gained satisfaction more than tried to kill the other person by intimidating them in this sort of ritualized uh, battle. Duets, interestingly, also um, a distinctly European art form, one that you all know primarily through music, and the idea of, of two performers passing ideas back and forth um, to one another. It's an art form that Mozart, in fact, grew up around and is quite famous for his duets um, on piano and other, other instruments, um, and which, of course, in the 20th century uh, evolved into a fantastic form of popular music that you all will know through things like uh, David Bowie and Freddie Mercury's Under Pressure which they famously sat down and wrote in one afternoon by just simply playing sounds um, against the other. And I've been thinking about the topic of debate in part because my next venue for a discussion like this is going to be in this room in the new year. I've recently received an invitation to, uh, to attend the Distinguished uh, Great Debate Hall at the Oxford Union in which the form of the modern British debate um, is born at about the same time that my school was founded in the 1840s and has since become uh, a setting in which prime ministers uh, and many others uh, in, in a form very different than, than I think this stage this evening, um, test ideas in public audiences in what are called public business meetings uh, at the Oxford Union. And my great fear in the event is, of course, their idea of a screen is this peculiar tablet on the wall with words carved into stone, which is going to make my preferred form of presentation utterly useless. I'm incredibly nervous to try and figure out what to do in that setting. Um, but, of course, what's interesting in it and what carries on from the more military forms of duel um, that we know is this idea of a ritualized exchange of ideas um, or, um, or thinking. And, of course, that itself is a very British tradition, um, and it's one that runs very much through our public program today, which is uh, about 160 years old right now and began with John Ruskin in the 1850s, presenting ideas in halls that would test where, um, where Victorian moralists thought the idea of art or architecture should be going. And it is, of course, itself emulating a far more um, compelling example of that sort of activity, which took place today in the form of an 11 and a half hour debate that this person led. Um, it was a debate that lasted longer than my flight over from Los Angeles, from London today. Um, 
Prime Minister David Stoke, Cameron. Where the pottery is community. I wish the Shadow Chancellor would occasionally shut up and listen to the answer. <laughs> Other members can now follow the Prime Minister's advice to the Shadow Chancellor. We need a bit of order. The Prime Minister. I may be alone in finding him the most annoying person in modern politics, but I... I anyway, uh, I'm sure... <coughs> Every Wednesday at 12 o'clock, Prime Minister's Question Time is a time in which that activity becomes the center. And it takes, it takes the form of six questions that are brought forward to the Prime Minister to try and answer and carry forward this tradition of knowledge or political belief, somehow um, the result of performance and not simply premeditated scripting of where the ideas should be going. Um, so as I've been rehearsing what to do with um, with that sort of a venue in the coming month or so, what I've been looking at is, of course, the back catalog of dueling strategies that I think many of us here will know well through many different forms, um, and probably very different forms than David Cameron uh, is aware of. And I think what, what strikes at the center of that for me today is, of course, the struggle between this idea around language that in the 20th century made a great deal of sense, which is to try and find a kind of nuance or a middle ground between two positions, which maybe most famously is articulated by someone like Wittgenstein in the 1940s in his philosophy of language moment, when what he was of course making an appeal to is the idea that language itself is always, always a vague, unclear, imprecise reality in the world. Wittgenstein lays down the groundwork for a 20th century theory of language that many of us know becomes um, the base for, over the next 30 or 40 years, the idea that meaning itself, truth, meaning, value, is continually being performed, reinvented, and transformed. And um, uh, at a moment in which the, the, a model of language really becomes a model for culture itself, I think sets up a, a condition in which a general suspicion of dialectic or binary meanings is something that many people move very far away from. And that might have happened originally amongst a, a group of conservatives, particularly in North America, that, that grew wary and suspicious of postmodernism and the idea that anything can mean anything. What's become interesting more recently is, of course, the way in which that kind of view, that kind of disbelief of dialectic um, uh, exchange um, is articulated by scholars like this. Kieran Healy's now sort of semi-notorious paper that was delivered last summer at the American Sociological Association. And this is a guy whose normal papers are things like the performativity of networks, the kind of thing that I think people in here would be reading most of the time. Uh, he's got another paper from a year ago called Data Visualization and Sociology. Um, he's thrown it out the window. And in fact, this, this paper, which um, got many people's attention because of, of uh, that quite compelling abstract, three-word abstract, which is what now sits in research libraries around the country, um, really tries to lay down the groundwork for a very different sort of suspicion <coughs> of nuance and its value in a world that's, of course, becoming increasingly binary and oppositional in everything from its political regimes to economic equity and fairness, as you can see what he's writing here. I shall argue that for the problems facing sociology at present, demanding more nuance typically obstructs the development of theory that is intellectually interesting, empirically generative, or practically successful. Um, he, he goes on, and it, it's, this is in the opening paragraph or two of this paper, but he says, as alleged virtues go, nuance is superficially attractive. Isn't the mark of a good thinker the ability to see subtle differences in kind or gracefully shade the meaning of terms? Shouldn't we cultivate the ability to insinuate overtones of meanings? On and on. With the point being that anything worth studying is worth studying with a degree of nuance. He throws it out the window and tries to make an argument, in fact, that the far more um, dialectical uh, construction of knowledge today it provides a, a model for scholars and, and scholarship itself in a time like ours. Um, and it will be uh, a, a kind of struggle that many of us know through this kind of story, which was science fiction 20 years ago when it appears. And uh, last month, of course, 
uh, John Woo's script is played out in real time with this amazing fellow, um, Patrick Hardison, uh, a firefighter who lost uh, his face when it was burned off him uh, uh, a year and a half ago, um, uh, receiving the first ever World's Complete Face Transplant, which has graphic images that I was going to include, but they're so close to some of Hernan's images and models that I just <laughs> couldn't do it. Unbelievable kind of folding of a face over this fellow. Um, so the question really of, of, of dual and opposition, and um, any kind of a, uh, for me, any, any kind of a consideration of that topic inevitably brings upon, the, uh, upon oneself the own, one's own biography of this problem. Um, this is a, uh, a poster that was done in one of the installments for an exchange I had with Mark Wigley, um, which was usually set up like this, where I would take one position, Mark would take the other, and what we would try and work through is the ways in which a New York versus London um, kind of uh, distance allowed us to look, at, um, to look at architectural positions in a different way. This was a poster that somebody did uh, in New York three or four years ago during that series, um, which coincidentally was the month in which I broke a foot and Mark tore out his Achilles heel. And just to prove you the, the true gladiatorial impulse of these sort of things, they used it as the basis for trying to advertise the event. Um, so, duels would be, let's say, one extreme of the spectrum. I'm sorry, I've tried to pick a couple of images that would play with the local crowd here to try and remind us of how that works. Um, at the other extreme, and no less constructed, is of course the idea of duets, and, um, and that unexpected uh, um, uh, convergences can be seen to occur through an informal exchange. Um, that was the rubric I used when trying to bring these two participants together in the first ever lecture of a series we organized, like this one that's about to launch here, now almost exactly 10 years ago, um, in January. Uh, 2006, when these two jovial characters, um, and this was us about 10 minutes before we began an evening, um, upstairs in the office, having a good time, which turns grim very quickly, um, uh, very, very quickly. Um, and the point that both of them had made in, in text message exchanges leading into the event was that in their 40 plus years in architecture, they had never shared a stage together. And that I found interesting enough that it, that it, as a way of recording the extent to which architectural culture has come to be dominated by what Ed Tufta has called the cognitive style of PowerPoint, of a kind of monologuing <laughs> of material or information um, that almost becomes the only way in which we can define architectural knowledge itself. As I said, it didn't go well. Um, very quickly, uh, Peter turned on me for trying to suggest there were a series of, of questions that he hadn't agreed to answer and had no interest in trying to explain. Um, uh, and I spent the better part of two and a half years, uh, in effect, trying to transcribe that evening into that first edition, uh, the first volume of, of the Architecture Word series. Um, the oppositional description of one personality or project against another, though, is something that's got a deep history through, through modern architecture itself, and it's something we all know. Famously, this image, which, um, which the Dutch especially to this day are, are, are incredibly annoyed about because of the, the ways in which Mart Stam is airbrushed out of the final image that's published, um, is a fantastic kind of record of the way in which one personality is formed in contrast to another, and it's something that we can find, I think, over the years repeated throughout and is probably the one thing that connects architecture to other forms of culture and not only entertainment in really striking ways. Um, the contrast and the simultaneous construction of these two projects, right, and the sort of arms race that was on at the time to create a black glass house on one side uh, by an architect um, critiquing that architect that he's um, most closely associated with. And of course, that was the setting for the famous fallout one night in which the two never spoke again. 
during their lifetime. Um, Mises' response to Philip, by the way, which was, was made several years later, this is almost 20 years after Johnson's original quote when he was asked by Dirk Lowen, uh, when Mies was asked what did he think of Philip Johnson as an architect, um, was he a historian or an architect, and Mies responds, neither, nothing at all. He had only studied at Harvard <clears throat> and found his way to form a connection with MoMA. And the, the oppositional character of modern architectural knowledge is so well installed that you can understand why Peter would choose a title like Oppositions for one of the formative journals in post-war North American architecture. The idea that we form our identity in opposition or, or outright combat with those that have come before us provides one of the great templates, really, for how the stories of modern architecture have been written which are, of course, enemies that are sometimes quite real, friends who are sometimes quite real, friends who are sometimes imaginary, um, and uh, even amongst different generations of architects. This is Rem Koolhaas in 1974 presenting what would become the first chapter of Delirious New York to Wallace Harrison, who, of course, becomes one of the heroes of that story um, at, when it's eventually published. This is Norman Foster uh, visiting Oscar Niemeyer within a few weeks of his death at 104 years old. <clears throat> and the point that Harold Bloom makes in, in his, his analysis of the anxiety of influence is, of course, what artists always do is construct their own genealogies. That isn't a received feature of our world or our disciplines. Part of the project of an architect is to construct that legacy of other projects or other personalities around which they reform the figure of what an architect is. It might sometimes be over the course of 400 years, like this comparison between Andrea Palladio and uh, uh, exactly 400 years later, Cedric Price. <clears throat> but one of the interesting things in that combat is the way in which the figure of the architect is herself continually reconstructed. And I think it's that reconstruction of that figure that becomes one of the really foundational ways to describe not just what architects do, but the very idea of what a modern experimental architectural education is. The confrontation that we ask our students to construct on their own terms with those figures behind them that they take to be themselves or previous versions of themselves. This are the students and teacher of one of our diploma units at the AA at their end of year exhibition, uh, sitting in front of a one-to-one -one photograph of their previous lives and behind those lives, some of the people that they spent their year working on in the formation of their own projects. And of course, it's that idea of a multiple construction of personality that that would link that kind of an image with something like Peter Blake's cover of, of uh, Sergeant Pepper, in which the Beatles sit in 1960s all black version on one side of the screen and to the right, the 1970s hippie Indian version of themselves, and then surrounded by a collection of modern pop icons that for them was their milieu through which they tried to reinvent their own art form. It's an idea that's touched upon in the opening paragraph of, uh, of Deleuze and Guattari's Thousand Plateaus, which I quote here, which is this fantastic thing that Guattari himself says about their writing, which is, of course, they always saw themselves as multiple selves. The question was simply how to turn that schizophrenia into something productive, and particularly as the analyst that he was, not something to deny. And again, I think that's something that we can find over and over again in the combat that takes place between generations in any discipline, but most certainly within architecture. So one of the terms I'd like to set as a productive one is the idea of someone that's neither an enemy nor a friend, but sits in this strange space in which the combat plays out in a productive way. What we could think of as the frenemy model that Mies and Philip Johnson probably best embodies. The other model that we could look to would be something like multiplicities, in which the architect or the artist knowingly constructs multiple versions of themselves. Um, 
or the uh, uh, dummies that stand in for the figure of the architect in various settings. This is one of our teachers in 1972, Mark, uh, Mark Fisher, who sadly died a couple of years ago. Um, at the interview stage in which he would interview AA students to enter his studio, and he wanted to watch how you would react to both the real Mark and the fake Mark. Um, there are many, many artists that have worked with this idea of how they describe and understand the construction of their own artistic selves in relation to others, to the point of someone like Andy Warhol putting Edie Sedgwick in the front of every picture with him sitting behind. <clears throat> and of course, the genealogy of a story like this, this sort of a, of a photograph reminds us simply that that combat is itself something that sits within a genealogy in which the frenemy-enemy model um, is often hidden in our own personal histories. And I think I'll stop there. Thanks, everybody. OK, so um, to Maybe, maybe to get the, the ball rolling, um, since you were in, ma in many ways referring, there are two things I want to pick up. One is, uh, at the very end, you kind of look back to our first of this conversation with 10 years ago. Remember, our thesis, not thesis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And part of the conversation was how important it was to define who were your friends and your enemies to build a thesis. But the, the, the question I would like to open the conversation is more like, in this time and age, do you think that this binary model, like it has been a very successful model for the production of this course in architecture, this kind of antagonisms or oppositions, right? Um, is this still valid in this time and age in which uh, it's not so clear like what the nuances or the degrees of separations are becoming much more difficult to identify? Like, in many ways, I argue that one of the things I want to do soon enough is I want to have a whole conversation about the May 68 so we can bear it for once and for all because I'm so fed up with it. And in many ways, um, we still are under that, op that illusion of the May 68 that you're on one side or the other one. But mm. it's not so clear to me that that model of operation, as an intellectual model I'm talking more than anything else, is still a valid one. Mm. Uh, it clearly, at least for the students or the young faculty, I don't see it that clearly yet. And, and if so, how we can start to anticipate what else would emanate? And I think you, the last month when you, talk, you start talking about the tribes and the tribal culture that is not, maybe is not any longer about two clear bands or two clear yeah. territories, but it becomes more a tribal thing. So maybe that's a way to start. Is this still the, the opposition is still a valid model or? Or is it just a face? It's not that useful these days. I mean, maybe one thing that, that would, would come out of that question would be probably a realization that, that to, to think in, either in terms of duels or duets, both of those things demand the idea of a disciplinary project. And, and I think that's really what lies at the root of this, whether the disciplinary project in architecture has got any relevance or not in an architectural culture that's becoming increasingly tribal and dispersed and hybridized and like most forms of culture now sits in, in, in fact, for many within architecture will be described by the proximity between architecture and something else. I think, I think that is an interesting condition of our time, um, but I think the disciplinary project on its own will simply become one of those tribes that will become clearer and more articulate in how it tries to construct such a project. Um, I think whether one sees oneself in combat with those other figures around around one's own project, or building upon, in a more strict sense of, of, of knowledge and its traditions, the work that's gone before, in both cases presupposes that there's a stability in the field that I think a lot of people are trying to undermine. And I think productively so. Um, the question really for me is if, it, if things are tribal, are there forms other than the oppositional ones of putting two particular characters on the stage at any one time that might be interesting? Now that you say this, uh, uh, it's one of those moments that, ah, why I didn't thought about that image? Because now when you talk about that, I'm thinking Lucha Libre, 
right? Yeah. Like when you go to Mexico, they are they they, they start one to one, and they they have this combination that is three against three, four against four, and they change band, and yeah. they change teams in the middle of it, and then it gets a free for all, and it's this broad thing, which I think is is um, to me is one of the most interesting characteristic. Like, for example, I, I see a growing. Um, which for the lack of a better word, I've been calling it like a kind of a niche, digital postmodernism, but it's unfair. It's an unfair characterization because I think it's more than that. I think it's more the idea of mashing or producing new coherences about multiple things, which I think you have to do this with this idea of what I was saying Lucha Libre, which is, it seems like certain ideas will start in one camp, mm. halfway will switch camps, Mm. Or we see teams, and they will start fighting against the teams that was supposedly to be original. And I understand that it, it, there is an interest in value in that, but at the same time, I think it, to to me it raises a problem in terms of what 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 is the value of judgment in terms of what is what we do. Because yeah. if if we get to a territory that everything goes, which I don't think is the case, but to be fair, but. It's clearly we are in, in, in a kind of an interesting period of inflection in relation to that. So um, hmm. the, the point will be, what are, what are the mechanisms in which we start to redefine how we judge these things? In, in the sense, because one, one of the things about the good thing about the duet or the duet is, it's fairly binary, so it's, it's to set up a set of values to assign to them. It's not that it's easy, but certainly it's, it's more moral. And when you have these multiple ones happening as the one, it requires a different kind of a yeah. maybe intellectual apparatus. And it's not clear to me how we're going to develop that. I mean, I, I suppose one of the contexts that we'd want to think about in, in, in our shared interest in bringing back the possibility of a, of a, of a duel or a du duet, putting two people together on a stage, is, is that culturally, the, the larger context within architecture and art world and, and others today is that we live in a Biennale universe. We, yeah. we live in a world of a kind of continuous circling of Biennales that are now in nearly every city around the world and that sort of tribal um, reality that we're just filling rooms around the world with content is happening continuously and I think one of the instincts that people are trying to to channel is is the question of how one how one steps back from that continuous curation of content, which is currently up in Chicago. I get literally a spam email every, every, yeah. every hour from Chicago. Like, I don't know who's doing that, but it's just been automated. And, you know, that, that to, to think if there are other forms, and interestingly, the kind of forms that you're suggesting here are more historical <coughs> than they are contemporary. The duel, the duel or the duet is literally an archaic 18th, 19th century model not just for performance, but for the production of knowledge. Stephen Miller's book on the history of, uh, fantastic book in Yale University Press a few years ago on the history of the conversation, maps out the way in which the conversational exchange of ideas that happened in Europe in salons beginning in the 18th, 19th century gradually comes up against the arrival of modern media in the 20th century and is literally cut at its knees. The idea that we would sit as members of different creative fields together and in the course of an evening's conversation believe that ideas could come out of that that wouldn't happen sitting back in our own studios was what drove the arrival of things like the Bloomsbury Group in London in the neighborhood the AA is located in. We were literally, as we moved into the square in 1917, it was the moment in which the artists, the social thinkers, the politicians of the Bloomsbury Group came together every Thursday evening, famously, in, a, in somebody's salon or, or what we'd call today a living room, simply to talk about the day's events. One of the interesting things in that experience, Miller, Miller tracks through, is how that group of people, however brilliant, you know, Virginia Woolf, Strachey, you know, brilliant philosophers, However interesting they were within their own fields, strange things happened when you put them together and ideas started to be bantered around that led to things like um, women's rights in, in England and Europe, the, the, the suffragette movement that emerges out of that, equal rights more broadly across the races, universal conscription, the idea of of fighting against the, the, what at the time was the dominant belief that, that everybody had to serve in military force. Things come out of those forms that you could say today, the, the question I guess would be where is it happening now? 
in the disciplines have become a bit like the tribes within our own particular discipline of architecture have become better at kind of understanding themselves on their own in relation to a larger world, but not by a deliberate exchange between them. Um, that's the, that, for us, is one of the things we're really trying to test, is whether it would be interesting, whether there is value in asking someone to sit down at a table and without script, and even without this kind of a device, believe that there's some value in that activity itself. And I think the difficulty today is that we all tend to view it as a form of performance. Right? And we tend to judge, like the photograph I just showed of the Oxford Union, one of the most successful recent visitors there was Johnny Depp. Well, I wonder why. I mean, the guy knows how to hold a room, right? Ronald Reagan was in that same room. Richard Nixon was in that room. Every prime minister, including Winston Churchill, has had to stand up and in an evening perform in that room. Right now, performance and its culture, of, the culture of performance in many fields is overwhelming the, a genuine belief that actually just the exchange that might take place between people might spark an idea that otherwise wouldn't have happened on their own. And I think in many ways, we always try to recreate those conversations that happens behind doors, which usually are the most interesting ones, and for some reason they can never be replicated in front of an audience. Yeah. There's something, I don't know, is this political correctness or the, the, the desire to impress? I, I don't know what it is, but it never amount to that. But, uh, <clears throat> I mean, moving into a, 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 into kind of a, a different territory, which I think is, is part of a, what I would think is interesting in relation, for example, to... Uh, the evolution of, of, let's say, technology and the kind of a neo-conservatorism hmm. reactionary to it, like, it seems to me that the cycle is always the same. Like, there is a kind of a logic of progress that evolves to a point, and then there is a kind of, it comes to a moment of insatisfaction or dreams unfulfilled, and the reaction is, it became like a reactionary one and so on. What it seems to me is an interesting phenomenon these days is some, that, that some kind of that reaction or that resistance is coming from some of the young people. In the sense, for example, there is this, uh, this, this kind of a fetishism of an era that they were not part of it. Like people like you yeah. and me, we grew up, I, I don't know, with black and white TV and two channels and so on, so, and, and vinyl and so on. But some, some young guys today, they want to listen to vinyl, but they were not part of their history. So there's a it's kind of a fetishism of a history that they were not part of it, and they start to recreate. And I would argue that in, in the schools and architectural idea, we start to see a little bit of that. We, we start to see a nostalgia of something that they were not part of it. So if you're nostalgic about something that you were not part of it, it's not nostalgia. It's something else. What, what is it then? What's it I don't know, but it, it became like a trend, or it became something like a style. And then I'm still a very old school in which the notion of a style to me is a bad thing. But I don't know if by, by intellectual conviction or by the way I was educated in which hmm. I mean, hardcore modernism and national yeah, style. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in that problem of uh, this kind of, uh, kind of a conversion or clash of what I would call a techno nostalgia. I mean, the, 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 the fake or the fictional nostalgia of something that hasn't happened yet. Or not that hasn't happened, but it's something that didn't happen to you, and you're nostalgic about it. And there is this super interesting episode of Portlandia, when the guy say, "I came back from Port de Port Seattle, and the '90s are amazing." 1990s? No, no, 1890s. So there are all these people growing beers and growing their fruit and whatever, like the old people trying to go to the 1890s, right? So I, I'm not. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know if there is any question about this, but I find that interesting. This kind of a, there is a patina of nostalgia that is a fake contracting nostalgia, like the, this kind of a rebirth of drawing, for example. Mm. But they're made by computers, so it's a completely different logic. So the question to me is: Is this a cycle, like we always go progress, reaction, progress, reaction, or this open up <clears throat> a whole? new thing. Like, for example, I would be much more interested in kind of a, a digital cessation than a digital postmodernism, in any case. Um, hmm. and, but as somebody who runs a school like yours, which in many ways is much more fragmented, let's say, than a place like Sire, because we are at the end an American institution, so we have an structure that is actually more rigid in many ways hmm. than the, 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 rigid, the, the, the structure of diplomas and units and all that. How you frame that? I mean, how you deal with that level of fragmentation, you know, or you don't? I mean, you don't care about it, and 
Sanko Hills would build by himself down the road. <laughs> that was a wrong thing. Point yeah. point. You, you totally win. You, that question wins. I, I, I don't know. I, I think um, on, on, the, on the nostalgia point first, Firstly, I, I think... I'm just starting, so I'm trying to I know, figure we're warming out up. how to don't screw up. We're, 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 no, but you've got to want to. There's got to be an instinct to want to do that. I think, uh, in part because our job is to get other people to make, think more interestingly than we do, right? And you don't do that by offering a model for them to emulate. My God, that's just like a disaster, right? It, it, to, have the, to have a belief that, that, that thinking is that monolithic or, or agendas exist across the level of an institution and not within an individual mind. I think, um, I think that touches on the question of, of the sort of t tribal structure within, within architecture today. But from what I like, what I find interesting in the nostalgic impulse that you're citing, and I don't know if it's real or not, but, but and we've certainly experienced the return to history. Like, I, I, you know, I'm of a generation where the arrival of personal computing was like a big deal back in the 90s. It's now the last century. Yeah. Like my stu I literally have students younger than Photoshop enrolled in the school. Like, <laughs> I can't get my head around that. My, That's in fact a way to measure time. My, right. my, my version of the nostalgia <laughs> that I presented when we were in Syracuse was to point to 1984, which is the year that forced me to leave the West Coast because of a building that was built in Portland, which I thought was so horrible I had to move to New York. <laughs> and it's now, of course, being celebrated on its anniversary. and. Um, and by the way, the real Portlandia was the sculpture in front of that Michael Graves building, not, <laughs> not, not, the, uh, not, this, not this funny series. Um, um, but we have to remember architectural knowledge from its invention has been incredibly nostalgic and historical. Yeah, right. No, no, I mean, architecture is nostalgic by definition. The only, the only extant text from antiquity on architecture, which is published almost exactly 2,000 years ago by a young Roman architect and presented to his emperor Augustus, is nothing but a historical record of his own random career, which packaged together not only declares architecture as a form of knowledge, those 10 paper scrolls that became the 10 books of architecture, um, but of course famously a thousand years later is rediscovered and launches the frigging renaissance. Like, I mean, how did that happen? You know? I mean, talk about multiplying the, the historical dimension of architectural knowledge you know, which originally is one-to-one -one and is then one-to-one -one with another thousand years on top of it and has continued to evolve ever since. I think that suppression of the historical dimension of architectural knowledge is, I think, one of the great tragedies of the 20th century. My moment as a director of satisfaction was when in the year 2012, I surpassed the longevity of Walter Gropius at the Bauhaus. He lasted exactly six years until his students wrote a petition to throw him out of the Bauhaus. Do people know why? Do you know the reason they, they reject him? He refused to teach architectural history. Like that was his only rule, that in the 1920s, history had no relevancy. You know, which is a pretty good stance to take, but it was insane. <laughs> And it was a perfect record of students knowing more than their I directors. Know. I don't know. I, I start right? to like workers now. I, I never liked exactly. the Greek. But now that you so in the, the So in like the it. 1970s, one of my predecessors at, uh, at the AA, Alvin Boyarsky, famously, he's elected director of the AA. In 1972, he throws a 100-year-old archive literally away. <laughs> I reopened the archive in 2009, I think. I mean, you know, we have like three drawings now. <laughs> I found in a wall between two rooms in Bedford Square the original competition drawings for the Houses of Parliament, which had been buried like in a vault. I think the rejection of history is just one of those cyclical trends that provides a discipline a way to imagine its reinvention that assumes that can't be done by a more direct confrontation no, okay, with but, history itself. But we sh shouldn't we distinguish nostalgia from history? Well, that's, that's the style. That, that's the style argument, absolutely. Yeah, because I think it's, Th it, there's a weakened form of historical knowledge that's nostalgia and not the disciplined, scholarly, precise form that we'd want to make appeal to. Um, 
Um, but in, in, for example, the comparison you put up of those two figures, what I find interesting in Frank Gehry's definition of history is that it's his own. Like, the way to organize that catalog is that all you gotta do is look at the history of an 80-year-old architect, you can find everything. And of course, that's the value of being well, 80 if, if you and live, not... If you live long enough, you become exactly. history. Exactly. I mean, that's the first trick. Exactly, and you success. can see that photograph I showed of Norman Foster. The reason he flies there in May 2011 is wind has finally gotten out that, that, that you know, Oscar might be failing, finally. You know, he's 104. He had just gotten married a year before. <laughs> Norman was interested in that, right? Norman flies his jet out there. Oscar dies within like a week. It was really tragic. So basically, but Norman, he's learning. He's learning. So basically, Norman Foster wants to visit you. Do not accept his uh, 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 Yeah, no, no. I think what he wanted to 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 uh, to experience, think of it, is the is is the realization that 104 means nothing today, and because we're teaching in schools where. One of my duties in managing things like the pension fund of the AA is to understand actuarial tables in some detail. I have students who are going to practice architecture for the rest of the 21st century. That is awesome to me, right? And when you tell them that, they are just shocked. Like they're trying to get through the end of year. Like they're, they're thinking about June. We have an assessment system. I don't know if, if people here know it, but we have an assessment system in which you start a studio in October, you get to June, and at the end of that academic year, you put your portfolio on a table like this, and five tutors vote pass or fail. That's it. Like, that's our brilliant system for teaching architecture. It tends to put a lot of focus on June. <laughs> right? I, 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 I went through the same system. June. I went through the same system. It makes June a really interesting month. Um, uh, but of course, the more interesting question is how do, and I think it's a very serious question, how do you ground a form of learning and knowledge today with an understanding that you're going to be working for the next 85 years, the next 80 years, right? That is a compelling question. But let me ask you this last one, and then we open to, to, the, to the audience. Um, in relation to this notion of history and nostalgia, and in many ways, uh, which also tackles on presence and genealogy and duels and duets, and, and there is a fundamental difference, let's say, I would argue, between the European education, even though, okay, the AA London, always the British being a little bit strange about the European thing, but um, it's a fundamental different thing when you operate in relation with the weight of history when you're based in London, when you're in Los Angeles. Um, there, is, there, is, there is a kind of a cultural context of the way to think. <coughs> but I would argue that, for example, somebody like Mark Cousins, which I adore, and, mm. and there is, to me, there is, a, there is a fundamental difference of knowledge in relation to history in which... Um, in well, many, we, yeah, we have it. Well, you have one and also, but also yeah. it's more with the intention that this is a public intellectual. That what, what you're educating and form is a public intellectual. Unlike, let's say, the PhD model in America, we talk about it, yeah. which is more in a scholar and basically yeah. you're training a teacher. And I think that in somehow it's, it, it, it travels into mm. the culture of how you shape something. So mm. one is the idea of history to the service of the advance of the discipline. The other one is maybe history to to obsess over, over a specific moment yeah. sometimes doesn't amount to construct a future. Yeah. And to yeah. me, that, that, that is a very interesting problem in which I would argue that in a city like Los Angeles, a school like this one, we are not really bound by those problems. Like we, I think we, we, have, we have a very, <laughs> we, we have a very uh, professional relation with history because we, we keep our distance. Yeah. We, we don't have an emotional relation. No, but yeah, no, that's, that's I think it's a really good point. I, the one thing I would point to though is, is what an evening like this offers in a city like this, which is, is demonstration of this school's conviction to, to, to a public discussion and presentation of ideas. I, I find that a hugely important part of any school that matters. And I think the reason for that is exactly because we've, we're coming out of this horrible century that led to the industrialization and professionalization of architecture, which was just a bad thing. I mean, it was a horrible thing. Think of it, it, it when experimental avant-garde schools are formed in the early 20th century, they existed to contribute 
to a degree to the rising industrial conditions of the city, but largely as part of a larger cultural project that speculated on what it means to build our world and to live in it and to occupy it and what those ideas should be. And I think the, the advantage we have in London is that those people that Tom mentioned in his, in his kind introduction that come together as 20-somethings, they're six or seven people who were only 20 years old at the time, come together on an October evening in 1847, with this weird idea to create a school of architecture, the reason they did that was because there weren't any schools of architecture. Zero. And their idea, which was insane, was that it would be really interesting to learn architecture in a school and not as an indentured servant in what by that time was already a rising professional class of architects. It was a brilliant idea. The problem was they were so far ahead of the time, of their time, that they were in their 70s when the school itself launches in 1901. What I find interesting in the 21st century is how that 19th century experience, which was exactly the moment when Europe begins industrializing itself, globalization sweeps across the British landscape, what, what uh, Turner called the railroadification of Britain, the kind of destruction of nature, the turning of small cities into factories for the, uh, the appearance of the Industrial Revolution. That became a project for people to resist and the way they did it was in evenings like this. The AA invites in people like Ruskin and then all of his followers, who for several decades are the school. The school isn't teaching people to do things. It's a belief that bringing people together in the form of an audience is the only viable means by which ideas will move from one mind to another and do it in a way in which those audiences or groups of people can possibly contend with the forces at play. I mean, I really think the dominant mistake of architectural schools is to think their job is to make architects. It isn't. It is to make audiences that you all, as you're forming into architects, understand yourself in relation to. And that's why I think exchanges, not just this one, which isn't a particularly good example, I'm sure, given all your brilliant people you're going to have here in coming weeks, but but the, the, the opportunity we can provide as a sort of refuge, which I believe you're doing in downtown Los Angeles today, is, is to bring people together in an evening for no reason at all. I mean, you're not, you don't need to. You don't have to. You've had hard, busy days like the rest of us, but with an idea that there's something in that activity that matters. And I think the ability to turn audiences into into active agents in a world in which in the 20th century we were all conditioned to think of the audience as a passive receptacle where ideas just pour into us and we get converted into consumers or whatever it is, is one of the really great challenges. That's why I think conspiracy theory is so great. I mean, conspiracy theory, which by the way is the only viable form of theory left, <laughs> right? I find that incredibly compelling. It, it arrives roughly between 1963, let's say the Kennedy assassin, assassination and Watergate, 1972. It's first great masters of the art form, people like Don DeLillo, Thomas Pynchon, you know, great LA example, caught on to the idea that actually audiences have no rational agency, but they have the means to move ideas and, in fact, to invent ideas that people like you and me up on the stage couldn't have ever dreamt of, frankly, right? But what it does record is the idea that, that the audience, as we know it, is, is starting to change to it sometimes a very unpredictable component of life, but a really powerful one. And I think the use of conspiracies in architecture, which is another way to read some of these kind of of images is the demonstration of that, that ideas travel between minds and part of our job is to create a setting in which architects as they're being formed and their projects are being declared are being done knowingly, are, are knowingly doing that activity in relation to audiences. Not to take command and control but so much to be able to refine and develop ideas based on how they're received and in fact convert that into a next stage project. Sorry, that was a bit of a monologue, no, it shouldn't have been. I think that that's good to conclude the duel duet. And let's, before we conclude, well, maybe we're open to two or three questions. So we make the duel duet into a ball just, or just a party. I'm looking to see if there's anybody out there still. I was yeah, can we? Yeah. yeah. Oh. It's not that bad for one week before finals. Still holding. Um, thank you for that. Um, the risk of sounding like a bias fanatic, it's. Um, it's great to have the two directors of probably what are considered the two best schools of oh, architecture exactly. in the world. 
Was this seven? And under one. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, to, we already pay him. Now you have to pay nice, him some nice. money. <laughs> so I think that's great. Um, last summer, um, Brett, and you and I were discussing the idea of tribalness and how tribal a school would want to be. And today, you, you bring those comments together, and you talk about the pre-stability and the discipline that the schools are trying to undermine. And I wonder, um, like a school like SIARC and the school like the AA, who are considered stable and have a hmm. pre-stability that there's a known project or certain projects are expected to come out of these schools. If these projects didn't come out of the AA or SIARC that year, you'd think something went wrong. Yeah. Um, and I wonder how one can undermine their own school and oh, undermine I know. their own history. <laughs> do, you, do you have an answer to that? I, I mean, I know. Uh, we just did, I, they picked me. Okay, so my, my answer is the way to undermine it is to learn to make the place more boring. I think one of the preconditions of this kind of a conversation is that we're, we're, our schools are somehow both interesting. And the manufacturing of interest is itself a kind of industry today. And I think if you look at the career of someone like David Foster Wallace and how he ends his life with this 500-page rumination over boredom, and the potential that has in the world to allow a form of reflection and thinking, one of the great threats we have is perpetual interest. In other words, always trying to think of ourselves as, as having a job to, find, to create interesting new conditions in architecture. I think that in itself becomes what the, the sort of condition that Peter Eisenman critiqued in the paradox of modern architecture when he ended up writing a PhD that took on the question of what happens if you presume modern architecture is always a revolution if those people win. And it is always a revolution. What's left? Right? That wasn't ever speculated on, I think, in the original project. I think we suffer the same sort of fate now with an assumption that interest in and of itself is enough. It's no longer revolutionary. It's no longer radical. It's just interesting compared to what we saw this time last year. I think it might be really interesting to try and think of ways we can just make the place more boring. Just to see. I mean. It's a design project, too, right? I mean, at least Foster Wallace argues for that. I mean, he tragically does it at the end of his life. He became so bored, he killed himself, yeah. yeah no, no, exactly. There is that, there is that risk. Yeah. Um, Deleuze also, by the way, throws himself out of his, out of his apartment window. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say as a footnote, I, I don't think that these two schools, the work is that interesting. I just think that well, that's the other one is incredibly way worse, so by, by comparison, we look that interesting, but uh, um, so I'm not so sure. But I think you're right. I mean, there is, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, the, the industry, industry is one thing, but also I would argue that, um, I would argue that it's not such thing as an avant-garde anymore. I mean, there's no resistance, really. Like, it's all degrees of things, so everything goes. So if there's no resistance, how you can have an avant-garde? Yeah. So this idea of avant-garde, I think, I think, has become like a brand or industrialization of the idea of avant-garde. It's not that thing. That, that thing. But, but all I, the perversions have been, they're legal now, pretty much. You really have to go really far no, out. No, I know. Really I, I, far out I know. to really somebody say, um, oh, you're a pervert. <laughs> no, sorry, I lost it. I had something there on that. Yeah? No, I know. The, the, the avant-garde is only thinkable always with the historical. That's one of the reasons the avant-garde is so difficult to imagine now is, of course, we have no, 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 use, no, no way to use history in some way. And I think that's the one thing. David Green said it best, I think, amongst my tutors back in London. We said, you know, the great thing we had in the 60s was an ancient Mies van der Rohe to just hate. And everybody hated him uniformly. I, I mean, I have a photograph of Cedric Price in 1962 sitting in front of Walter Gropius, who looks like every German grandfather you've ever met. And by that point, Cedric is already on a different planet. Yeah. But they had, that, that's they, interesting. they had the fight. And I think, you know, the, the project that we did a few years ago called First Works, which showed that generation of people like Miralis in the 60s and 70s and the work that they're inventing, these are all really young people. And the reason we put the show and the book together was to show students that you know, people in their 20s can have a clue. Like, it's possible. But of course, the thing they had were a bunch of ancient people <clears throat> who were pretty easy targets. And between 1962 and 1969, they all die, which is like the other great advantage. The problem we have is, of course, people like Frank Gehry, 
keep retiring and every five years do bigger buildings. Right? I mean, again, it's going to be one of the struggles for a discipline that organizes itself in deep time, is that the longer careers become, the harder it is for a next generation to really do battle with something, because you never quite know when they're going to go. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, particularly now that, now that you know, uh, archives no, are owned the, and the, operated the way they in are. In that concept, my problem is right now, most of the people I hate, they're my age or younger. <laughs> Which is a kind of tragic thing, right? <laughs> Any no, but I think it's learning to hate younger versions of yourself. That's where it's productive. Right? I, I mean, that's I, what Deleuze argues. That's a good point. You know. Any other question? I know the historians. We really like killed. I know that the, the historians in the room will have, have something to say. I don't mind asking a second question. <laughs> Anything else? Have we have we just like totally killed it? Yeah. I think so. We're done. Well, no, I'm Should we go back to the Star Wars image? Just to remind everyone, the 18th of December. I think they're going to be okay without us promoting I it. I had though. originally asked him for a November, uh, December date because I knew when that, I that know, was coming but we, out. Uh, I mean, we finished the 17th so everybody can go to see exactly. it. Um, exactly. That's what we do in LA. We yeah, just exactly. watch Star Wars. Um, All right. Uh, you guys have the Royal Shakespeare Company. We have Star Wars. It was um, shot in London, just to, just to remind you. Fair enough. Exactly. Fair enough. Um, Brett, once again, thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Dual or duet? I don't, I don't know. Okay.